So a very good evening to all of you who've joined us today. Welcome to the Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies, Saturday Vibe Talks. We gather here every Saturday, of course, at Saturday Vibe Talks um, to uh, listen to people, to humans of the Himalayas who have something important to share about the mountains they so love and we all love. Uh, we range from topics like um, archaeology, anthropology, history, art, music, um, medicine, whatever. Anything that has passion for the Himalayas has to be uh, invited. Anyone has to be invited who's here so that we can gain from that knowledge and spread the word and spread that knowledge. It's so important because the Himalayas give so much to us and we have to give so much back. So we do it in our own way, a virtual sort of way. And uh, um, please join us if you haven't. Start coming every Saturday and join us for our talks. Uh, we have our, our monthly newsletter, which we started uh, last uh, December from Anur Anurnachal to Jammu and Kashmir. And this month, we have Philosophies of the Himalayas. And today, with Philosophies of the Himalayas, our very first speaker is, I would say, uh, the very kind and compassionate Dr. Lakpa Dolma who takes us on this journey of Tibetan medicine, of philosophy, of, of philosophical practice, of philosophy of practice. Dr. Lakpa Dolma's leaning towards medicine started at a very young age, thanks to her father, an experienced herbal medicine practitioner and his teacher late, Trulku Sangye Kunga Azogchen, master from Gepcha Gompa. The healing of people through spiritual practices, as well as Tibetan medicines, left a lasting impression on her young mind. She completed her early years in the Tibetan Children's Village School in the Himalayas and went on to attain her Kachupa and Mendrapa, which are uh, degrees like um, MD. Uh, MD is the Mendrapa degree from the prestigious Tibetan Medicine and Astrolog Astrological Institute in Dharamshala, Himachal. Dr. Dolma has practiced Tibetan medicine for over 20 years. It has taken her to places like South Africa, where she was the only Tibetan doctor, healing her patients and introducing them to her lineage of Tibetan medicine. She has conducted a number of workshops and given lectures. She's giving one now today, and she's also a consultant doctor for Sore Kang. In the past, she's been with the a resident doctor with the Jiddu Krishnamurti School in Bengaluru. Uh, she balances her life as a mother of three now grown-up children. Uh, and motherhood also prompted her into thinking about the welfare of mother and child, especially in the rural Himalayas, that uh, how to give access to them. And of course, in the Himalayas, we have Asha workers who go from village to village. But, you know, a lot of times women are very hesitant in uh, bringing out uh, things that they go through at a personal level, at an emotional level. So um, it's important to address that. And uh, she feels very strongly about it. In the present, Dr. Dolma sees her patients at Bangaluru and has teamed up with our very own Raka Wellness Center, a unit of Hicks at Dhami, to have consultations, workshops and wellness programs both virtually and in person. So we are very, very happy to team up with Dr. Dolma because uh, the Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies is just not about culture and heritage. It encompasses healing also. And healness, uh, healing and wellness are very, very essential. When my mother passed last year, uh, I felt it very important to kind of uh, bring in the healing aspect because um, I think in today's fast-paced world, it's very important to um, uh, connect with these things, especially in rural Himalayas. And I do want to make an announcement. Um, uh, our very own Reena, Reena Solanki, who uh, uh, heads the Wellness Center, just completed her teacher's uh, training course in yoga. So we will be starting our uh, Wellness Center in Dhami Shimla starting um, March. And we will be doing a lot of courses and workshops relating to wellness, uh, which will include yoga, Tibetan medicine, um, and meditation. So all of you who want to connect, do connect to us. Uh, coming back to today's topic. Now, before uh, Dr. Dolma, I give the um, mic uh, to her. I have to tell her, tell you all how we met. And it's so strange <laughs> sometimes how the world connects. 
So it so happened, uh, one of my friends, uh, Ian Baker, who you may have seen in one of the talks, he told me there is this beautiful place here called Pure Land Farms, uh, where I am right now. I'm in Los Angeles. And about 20, 25 minutes away, there's this place called Topanga Canyon. Now, interestingly, I'm doing a project in that place. Topanga was a place where the Native Americans, the Tongwai Indians used to reside. And it's a very historic uh, place with... Um, early uh, beginnings. So I was very uh, curious to know what is this Pure Land Farms and I went online and uh, uh, there was a whole, um, uh, there's a whole lineage, the Sogwa, uh, Rik, Sova Rikpa lineage of uh, the medicine Buddha <laughs> and practitioners of Tibetan medicine there. And um, I chanced upon uh, five doctors and I somehow felt attracted to Dr. Dolma. Okay, and uh, whenever I say I felt attracted, it everybody said, "Hmm, what's going on?" Anyway, so uh, I I took a consultation with her on Zoom. Turns out she's in Bangalore, and we start talking uh, about you know health and all of that. And uh, then we said, "Oh, where are you from?" And she said, "I'm also from the mountains." Okay, where where uh, Himachal? I was like, "Where in Himachal?" And then she said, "Kulu Manali." I said, "Kulu Manali." Where in Kulumanali? She said, you wouldn't know. You know, it's a small place. You wouldn't know. I said, no, no, no. Try me. I, I, I want to know. And then she says, Patlikul. Now, I was shocked. <laughs> because Patlikul is a place where I sabzi leti thi. I used to buy vegetables from there. It was right next <laughs> to the place I live. It's like, uh, the it's Katrain, where I live. Ayushi would know that, right? Ayushi, Manan, Ayushi, all of you who are here. So, what are the odds of meeting somebody online in Los Angeles connected to Pure Land Farms in Topanga who turns out to be in Bangalore and comes to be from the place where I used to for the past four years. I have been there. She's from there. And my God, you know, this is what I call connections. And we connected and we started talking. We've become amazing friends. And now she's aligning her uh, medical practice with us. So I'm, I'm, you know, the way things are manifest you just have to watch out for them. So uh, that was my introduction to Dr. Dolma. <laughs> I'm so happy you're here. And I'm so happy that we are, you know, in the future, we're going to be doing things together. Over to you. Tell us about you, your life, your inspiration, everything. So start. And I will, I will just keep coming in and asking you questions. Hello, hello. Thank you, Sonali. Namaste, everyone. Tashi Jalek. In Tibetan, we greet. Uh, Tashi Jalek is the greeting when we meet first, or even when we are leaving for like goodbye, we also say Tashi Jalek. Tashi Jalek can be used uh, in many <laughs> terms. So, Tashi Jalek, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for having me here. And um, it's also a pleasure knowing you, Sonali. As I told you long, I think the Sonali is uh, one very kind of, uh, what do you say, pleasing name for me now. Because I have my, one of my best friends in Bangalore is, uh, she's here today, is Sonali. Anyway, so uh, yeah, like you said, um, <clears throat> even for me, it was a very surprising, someone knows my a small village. Whenever I talk about myself, in, I say I'm from Himachal, Kulumanali. And between that, I live between these two places. I would have introduced myself like that. And um, yeah, I was born and brought up in Himachal. I studied in Himachal. And um, I love the mountains everywhere. I, where I see the mountains, I always like it reflects me, my childhood. And um, somewhere like you, I also get uh, very much connected when it's about Himachal. And uh, the, uh, talking about the practice, how I got involved, like in your introduction, we talk about my father who, who, who had a great influence in my life. Like you said, I, in my bio, uh, from a young age uh, at home, uh, we were six uh, siblings and my grandmother, my grandfather, and they were two other people living with us. And uh, my introduction to, I would say, to life, I would say, before the medicine was from a very young age. And as you know, in Puffy Cool, we, we have the river beers running through and the mountains. And um, as a child, um, 
Uh, we used to play near the river beers and um, every day, every, now and often, you know, uh, while we're praying on the riverside, while swimming or washing clothes, sometimes we see the pious, you know, those dead bodies coming. And uh, there's curiosity. As a child, I would used to watch them, how this process, whole process from taking them. And they also sometimes the people throw money, you know, coins. They used to collect that also. We ran after that and we watch all the... It was like um, amusement uh, during the daytime. But at night, it used to be a nightmare for me. I used to think about the life uh, that we have and seeing oh, aging, oh, my grandmother, the grandfather, the old people at home. I'm then, then seeing my grandmother um, uh, getting ill, you no know, age factors. All this has always questioned me, you know, what is this life? Uh, how can we come out from this suffering? It looks like, and then discussion goes on. And my father used to heal us. If we have some problem, he used to make some herbal formulation. And yeah, if I go a little bit uh, about my father, uh, in Tibet, uh, he, before the Chinese invasion, uh, he was studying their medicine, Tibetan Buddhism and everything. But due to the invasion, he couldn't complete his studies. So coming to India, uh, they moved to the um, Kulumanali and they were, they, in the initial years, they were on the road, building those road highway, you know, to Manali, to uh, Ladakh and all that. So there was no time for him to uh, sit and study because it was about Roti and Kapra, you know, uh, for he has to look after his mother, his teacher. And so he couldn't continue. But, but still then, he was always into these herbs because in Manali, we have lots of uh, herbs, you know. So he used to go and on the way while walking, he used to collect and make medicines. At home, my grandfather or my father's teacher, who was my step grandfather as well, he used to do like all the uh, rituals at home. So some sometimes we are healed uh, through the spiritual practices, and sometimes with herbs. So this was my introduction from a young age, and also introduction to life. You know, when we say in Buddhism, we say the uh, keka nachi means birth, and then the then aging, the illness, and the death, you know? So these were all introduced to me from a really young age. So I always, you know, my father was always there for me to ask about these things, you know? And uh, especially uh, when during the time when my mother, grandmother was, you know, uh, very ill when she was like preparing for her next, so what was the journey, how she prepared, how my father prepared us, you know, emotionally and, and the life lessons. And then, but between these, uh, so how I got introduced to, if I could continue, uh, Tibetan medicine, uh, first thing was from my father. And then, uh, uh, like, uh, since I was like a second uh, eldest child, uh, it always lived with the feeling of the responsibility that someday I have to take care of the family, you know, give a very comfortable life to my parents and look after my younger siblings. But then also I see that sometimes my mother, my mother, after every birth, she gets sick, bad bitten, you know? So uh, with these you know, kind of um, uh, problems, you know, it was, I think, has some way affected me. So then started in, I think, I, think I was in class six or seven, I getting panic attacks. You know, I used to cry in, in, all of a sudden. I used to feel um, a restless palpitation. I used to sweat, lose sperm. And at night I couldn't sleep, uh, it, like some madness and kind of uh, things. And uh, my father used to say, oh, it's long, and he used to say long, long. And he used to give me something. Uh, but then he then he said, okay, let's go to a proper doctor, Tibetan doctor. And then in Manali, we have a small clinic, Tibetan uh, Menji Khan clinic. And uh, I, this was the first time I uh, saw a Tibetan doctor. She was a nun uh, and uh, she gave me medicines. And uh, I can say within a week, I, I felt the difference. You know, I was more calm, you know, but it took few months for me to uh, totally kind of uh, like normalize myself. But uh, then I, uh, uh, on and off, I took medicine for, uh, till I was in class 12. It's these panics and these attacks, uh, uh, as anxiety would attack me uh, during like near the exam time, you know, I would get, you know, anxious and all that. 
And then after 12, I joined the Institute or the Tibetan Medical Astro Institute through an entrance exam. And there I, I started uh, to know what was my problem. And then from then on, I never had this panic attacks. It's not that it never have, I don't get anxiety or anxious, but I know what triggers it, how I have to manage, how I can manage. I'm, I'm saying this uh, uh, in my introduction because I think uh, uh, it could be a different reason in today's generation younger. Uh, in schools also I see the young children go through lots of anxiety problems, anxiousness and all that. And uh, it's sad that when I heard, hear that the people, they took antidepressant medicine and all of that, you know. Uh, so this can be, I want to say, actually I want to convey that this can be healed through herbal medicines. It can be healed through some uh, home remedies. It can be uh, managed through your way of thinking uh, and changing your perspective towards life and the situation that you're facing. Uh, so that's my introduction, how I like I got introduced because I was healed uh, through that medicine. And uh, then my, of course, my father wanted me to study medicine because he couldn't finish. So that's how I was, um, I got uh, enrolled in the uh, Tibetan Medical College. It is a five plus one year course. So I completed in 2002 and now it's more than like 20 years so I've been practicing. Yeah, this is my, uh, what do you say, small introduction, introduction to, to my, uh, this one. Yeah. So do you want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, should I continue <laughs> or you can, you can? No, no, no. I, I, I want to ask you a few things. So, um, you said that uh, the uh, the spiritual practice is a very important mm -hmm. part of uh, Tibetan healing, right? Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. when you went uh, for your studies, uh, so mm -hmm. prayers was an integral part of the curriculum. Uh, and uh, could you tell us the process of how these medicines are infused with, uh, you know, the healing through mantras and why are mantras important? Like uh, in your opinion, as a practitioner, uh, if you could, uh, you know, give us that point of view. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, prayers, uh, like while we were studying, uh, every year we go to the mountains in uh, Manali. And uh, uh, during when before we start uh, collecting herbs, we have to offer some prayers because we believe that in the nature, it is owned by uh, 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 the beings which we can't see, you know water elements we call up us talk about elements right water earth and all these things uh, we uh, consider that it's owned by some beings which we can't see so we have to take permission from them you know? so for that we have some rituals to perform even after collecting the med medicines uh, back at, in the uh, institution again we have every month we have special puja especially on the 10th lunar calendar of that we have medicine buddha prayer we call it Sechu, you know. So we do, do that to bless the uh, herbs that we uh, have taken and also to kind of uh, bless ourselves as the practitioner or the person who is learning Tibetan medicine to be blessed by the medicine Buddha so that we can heal people, uh, well, what you say, more effectively. So this is, uh, so mantras have been uh, like, it's an integral part of Tibetan uh, medicines, even for, Taking medicine while before take medicine, we have on diet on bekhaze, bekhaze, maham, bekhaze, and the sum of this. So, this is a short form of medicine Buddha mantra. We decide that as a doctor, before we practice in the morning, we have to do again this, uh, uh, this uh, offer this prayer to bless ourselves and also the medicine. So, this is integral. And also, mantra uh, also uh, in a healing process, uh, like, uh, like. Uh, some kind of like wound or that, that maybe in Himachal is very like Ladakh and all that, Spiti uh, and Tibet, Tibet, Nepal. It's very uh, common that where people get healed by uh, mantra, um, blessed uh, butter, blessed water, blessed uh, wine, something like that. We apply that on wounds or we apply that on any uh, pain. Uh, that uh, is also one kind of uh, therapy too. But in today's, uh, uh, I would say generation or what I think this um, mantra is considered, you know, people like come orthodox or sometimes. And so I think this practice is being a kind of diminishing slowly, slowly. Uh, but I'm, I'm, since my father is a mantra practitioner for like now 40, 50 years, 
So I believe in that and um, I, my, I uh, kind of practice that. Um, but I, it's not like some kind of, uh, I would uh, induce this into my medical medicine or something like that, but it depends on person to person. If someone is interested, someone who believes in all that, we have this option also. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you could tell us more also, about, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, go yeah, ahead. I also to add like a uh, spiritual, when you say spiritual addition, and not only for blessing, also for people who are suffering, people who... Uh, like we call, we, uh, let's say in Buddhist, uh, we say karma, you know, so sometimes because of the bad karma of previous life or something of that karma, uh, sometimes our channels are blocked, you know, so things doesn't happen as you want, even though we work hard or if everything is going fine, but something is getting stuck. So we say this is a bad karma is uh, blocking. Uh, so for that, we have a special uh, prayer to purify or uh, it's like a cleansing or say, saying like for asking for forgiveness or something like that. We are again some prayers for that. And uh, in some cases like skin problem, you know, uh, we have Naga Puja, it, even in an Hindu day, I think they have that. So we have San Lutoro and all that. So we have special pujas and that, and we have found that people who, after doing that, the medication or the, what do you would say, prescriptions, whatever, it's like, uh, uh, becomes more uh, effective that we have found, found, you know. So this is also there in our uh, medical system. But this is, again, a choice of, of individuals, you know. So I want to know more about the medicine Buddha. Like when did Buddha take on the role of uh, medicine? And I know the medicine Buddha is represented in a very dark blue color in um, uh, the Thangka paintings with the bowl. And uh, uh, <clears throat> so if you could uh, enlighten us about uh, the Vajrayana practice, because I know in the Vajrayana tradition, medicine Buddha is very important, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Buddha, um, this, I, I think it, Tibetan medicine, it says that it's uh, a part of uh, Tibetan medicine has been from derived for the medicine Buddha. But also we have in our history, it says that Tibetan medicine is uh, in pre-Buddhist era. era. So we have a, a religion like, well, born, country, uh, born you know, so we, in born, they, we called it uh, Yushi in the one we have studied, Yushi or the four tantra. Uh, in the Bhon, they say Bhumshi. So it's, but when you look into the text, I think I haven't studied Bhumshi, but it's more or less the same philosophy and all the, the rituals and everything is same there. That just the name Buddha is not there. It's, we call them, uh, they believe in Tempa Sherab. So we have this uh, Tibetan medical system in uh, before the uh, Buddha, uh, Buddha. Yeah. Okay, so um, you do have to pray to the medicine Buddha and all the knowledge actually comes from the texts that you yeah, text. uh, you find, right? Yeah, and, that, yeah. Okay. The text we call the Gyushi, which is uh, um, uh, the father of Tibetan medicine, is Yutu Gyundin Gompo. The, the, the base of our medical text, the medical education is based on that book, Yutu Gyundin Gompo, father of the Tibetan medicine. Yeah. Okay, okay so tell us about... Uh, after you go through your studying, what is mm -hmm. um, uh, when you when you encounter your first patient as Doctor Lakpa Dolma? Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us about that experience, your fears, and uh, how you calm those fears. You know, whenever <laughs> I remember, and I'm sure Ayushi is here. You know, when we, we became we become lawyers and we go to the court for the first time, it's like, oh my God, this is the end of the world today. You know, <laughs> it's like so much of pressure that comes on to you to start practicing. So tell us about mm -hmm. that, that moment, that day. Yeah, that I was doing my internship. I, I still remember. And uh, even though we normally in Tibetan, we check pulse and we look into the urine, that's our normal. But then uh, we have also, we also take, uh, sometimes we take uh, blood pressure. And also to, to have exact uh, numbers to, to you know, follow up how, whether it's going down or not. So I was there and uh, I was nervous, you know, and the doctor said, you take on the patient, you know, and I was uh, this, <laughs> taking the blood pressure and I can't hear anything, you know, I was pumping and pumping. I kind of, what's happening with this guy, you know, and then after like uh, two, three uh, sec, a minute, I, I realized that in that uh, kind of, uh, you know, anxiousness, what do you say, I, was, I haven't put this stethoscope here 
it was on my neck i'm pumping and pumping that was my experience yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so that was your moment and we all remember our first moments like that right yeah. so yeah. Uh, when uh, did you start um, so uh, was the practice more with as um, an apprentice and then you started going on your own or was it like you finished and you started off on your own i i went for an, an internship after the then i went on my own i went to south africa i was there for like uh, almost 5 years i practiced in my own small clinic it's not a very big but i practice i give i started giving workshops there and uh, you know and the you know, what it was called that everywhere i talk about tibet medicine so there in the newspaper they say only tibet and south <laughs> doctor in south africa that's how it came out <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it must have yeah. felt really only tibetan doctor in south africa yeah. Yeah. so yeah. so tell tell me um with the medicines okay so of course you uh, uh in your consultations you talk about you know the emotional well being the lifestyle uh because tibetan medicine i believe is very holistic you don't just give a medicine for the problem but you look at the entire lifestyle of the person to make changes to to know what is and what isn't what is lacking right mm -hmm. so yeah. these medicines uh who goes and gathers these medicines from the mountains and during your training did you also go and learn about these various herbs did you pluck them what was your relationship with the herbs how well do you know them yeah during our five years course we have to as i said every um, in august we go to manali we have to go in the mountains and the teacher introduce our, all the herbs and then we have to collect them also as a, you know we have to collect them and uh, for to make medicines and uh, yeah and but uh, i would uh, say it's such a like vast subject you know the pharmacology is a very very vast subject and um, many of us didn't get like a particular like in that only subject herb is a different big subject you know so we didn't get to like go deep into that but we do have like hands on sometimes practice when we are formulating especially during uh making uh the we have something called precious pills which are formulated only some uh, ingredients of on doing only on at night at under the moon you know that time we have to go and uh, help the uh, workers there yeah this kind of we have done yeah so this is interesting that um, uh, the uh, the medicines themselves uh, they have an impact um, from where they grow what time they grow mm -hmm. and uh, you know what, what how the sun and the moon have an effect and that's mm -hmm. how we are as well right i always mm -hmm. wonder like when mm -hmm. we talk about the human body 70% is water and even the earth mm -hmm. 70% is water and how water uh, is affected by the movements right uh, by mm -hmm. the pull mm -hmm. and the push of the uh, sun and the moon mm -hmm. we also do and how these medicines kind of compensate and uh, help yeah. uh, balance so uh, my next question is like with these uh, modern day problems uh, you know we have very loaded uh, uh, prob uh, you know diseases uh the minute mm -hmm. you hear them you are like shocked oh my god i'm going to die or something like that uh but in tibetan medicine i'm sure these problems were there even before um in ancient times and there was a different word to it i always feel that how you define it actually uh is half the battle won uh you know something like uh when you talk about cancer it's such a loaded word and people say oh my god it's cancer you know but how do uh how does tibetan medicine define a disease like cancer or another disease or something which is terminal uh you know in nature how how do you define it yeah yeah that's what i often wonder what the innocence uh because i think western world i, I i'm not saying it's bad or something but every symptom or kind of has a name you know you know every problem has some kind of name but a terminal different terminology but in uh, soarikba or tibetan medicine we don't have that like uh, specific uh, name to every each and every uh, symptoms or something like that uh, like cancer or we have like nerim or like you know, like even for like uh, hiv we have, uh, when you look into the this even for the pandemic this corona 
uh, we can find out in our textbooks in the uh, in the textbooks we have uh, those formulas to make during those you know so it's like very fascinating especially during this pandemic year we have realized how how kind of uh, those rishis in you know, the olden days they knew about these things coming I mean, because it says that in or at a time there will be a, a, a phase uh, or an era where or there's something or uh, uh, virus or whatever which we can't we can't we can't see seen by our eyes will uh, through a year yeah you know through breathing the pandemic or uh, this can happen in the human world these are already said and during that time you formulate this medicine you decide this mantra it is always uh, said even for the like uh, that uh, like uh, cancer or whatever we call 10 we have that uh, for tumor and then, then we have, if you like look into the breast, for example, and then you can, if you're going deep into the Tibetan text, we can find out how it is like, you know, we can make out why it is happening. Not the, uh, even though we don't have like specific name for like that, but then the symptoms, everything is defined. We still be that like, like that, but it's like changes, you know, what do you call this? What is that? The shit, the, uh, the problems of the uh, the disease it has a, it changes like uh, even for the uh, the coronavirus it has like what do you call the mutate or something yeah mutates it, yeah it mutates yeah yeah. Like, it, yeah something like that so um, somehow we in Swadipa we we can make out you know okay this falls into this category you know we have all layers yeah, that's we have so even though we don't have now, now there's uh, of course um, with each coming new we are uh, giving names, you know, uh, for the problems that every, every new problem is coming. We we are giving our Tibetan name. This is uh, goes exactly to the symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, can you tell us about um, some anonymous case studies where uh, uh, Tibetan medicines have really helped where other medicines did not? Um, not that we are, you know, like oh. Uh, other medicines are not great or nothing mm. like that. But in your experience, in your own uh, experience of patients without taking mm. names, because I know confidentiality is an important part of mm. your practice. But any mm. case studies where you've really felt that, you know, uh, this was not, uh, you know, something that uh, was tackled by uh, allopathy or anything, but mm -hmm. Tibetan medicine mm -hmm. was able to address the problem and healed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my early years, uh, what I've always found or even even to date, but in my early years, I have always found, heard from my senior doctors and there's, oh, it's very medicine, very good for depression. That was one thing you have always been hearing. Even to, now, I can I see that you know, it's very effective. Um, if you can, uh, like, uh, I mean, the depression and uh, anxiety, these, these problems, you know, it's very effective. And... Um, uh, and diseases like uh, chronic problems, most of the chronic problems like rheumatism, arthritis, uh, even for diabetes and even for hepatitis B, uh, we have seen very, very good results. And uh, even for cancer, I would say, um, I would not say if it's like a post like stage, you know, it depends on stage, you know, uh, but then in early stage, it has, uh, has proved, you know, um, uh, good results, I mean, and uh, when I say uh, chronic uh, problem, because patient mostly the uh, the the patient we receive is uh, are people who had been like uh, now tired or who couldn't you know, get, get benefited by other medical whatever allopathic. So they come to the most of the time it happens like that, you know. So they say, okay, there's no cure there. And I would say. I would not like say, oh, okay, 100% Tibetan medicine cure cancer and all that. This is by some, I think it uh, goes beyond the uh, law or something. But then we have seen that um, uh, in people who are like uh, terminally ill, you know, uh, Tibetan medicine helps them to give a comfortable life, you know, people who are going through chemo or all that, it's very, very tiring for the uh, body. And also because of the strong medicines, uh, the side effects are uh, tremendous. And uh, in our uh, uh, experience, we have seen that Tibetan medicine actually helps them to minimize those, those side effects and also to help them to control that spread of uh, like cancer. You know, some, uh, 
spreading is a very uh, like metastasis, what you say, is very uh, uh, dangerous, right? So it helps in that in controlling these things, you know. Uh, in that area, I think it uh, works wonder. And even for women at the eating, I think uh, like uh, pregnancy problem, you know, uh, who can't conceive, we have seen tremendous uh, results um, in, in, in curing these kind of uh, problems. Okay, so um, uh, do you also publish? Um, is there a Tibetan medicine journal uh, where? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, and where is it available? Where can we find? Yeah, it? you mm -hmm. can find this if you can uh, uh, check www.minkikang.org. In that okay. way, you can find out. Yeah, okay. there are testimonials from uh, the patients. You can read all the testimonials. You know how patient name and everything written by themselves. Okay. And that you see, that's also okay. a good one to refer. Yeah. So uh, journals tell, also, yeah. Journals also. So tell me mm -hmm. about, um, you know, how you evolve in your practice, you know, because uh, you have to get better and better and better. So um, uh, how does the Tibetan medicine world and your practitioners, do you all get together annually to discuss? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, we have our association group of Tibetan medicine doctors, and mm -hmm. uh, we have our senior doctors. Like for me, I, um, I love to consult my senior doctors, you know, mm -hmm. so their experiences, their, uh, because in what, what uh, maybe I think it's with every other doctors in allopathic also, Every doctor says their own way of uh, looking into a person's problem, you know, uh, looking into the problem or diagnosing it and as well as prescribing medicines. Uh, so it's the same, same thing with uh, us. Uh, if, like Sonali, if you go to some other doctor, he might prescribe you another medicine, the one I have prescribed, you know. So he is looking at another point of view or through, you know, and I will- Or sometimes, into... sometimes they don't even prescribe. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, it yeah. can also happen, yeah. Because yeah. Uh, so are Ipa, uh, normally we say, when we talk about treatment, we say, say, che, men, che. first thing comes to say, say means the food, diet. Just the changing sometimes your diet can, if you have a small problem, it can go away. And in the future, it's also Tibetan medicine or the so are Ipa helps, not only for treatment or curing, it's also like a precaution, you know. So it helps, you know. So we say, say, che, men, che. first is the say or the diet, and chewing is a behavior, lifestyle. So these two go together, right? So when you can have these two good, um, uh, most of your problems can be solved. Even for a person who is uh, ill, after he gets cured, this say and chew should be there, no? So he has to have a good lifestyle, good dietary habits, all this. Uh, and after the diet, uh, say chew, then comes medicine. Only after that comes medicine. Then comes the therapy. So nowadays, what happens? People mostly come only to doctor when they are very, very ill. So we have to use all four of these, you know. And in our, I can add the fifth one, the spiritual uh, uh, therapy, so which means like like uh, counseling, uh, like giving advices, point of from you know, spiritual perspective, also just like a um, normal philosophy of life, you know. So in my practice, I always see that um, when I see patients. Uh, like giving that, you know, my perspective of how I live and how uh, uh, I would say um, minimize the, um, the, the, what do you call that? Everybody goes through problems, right? So the, the way that you, the, the pers if you can change a little, your perspective a little bit uh, uh, different, it can, your problem can be minimized drastically, you know? So that's, I think, the spiritual practice. You can, some people don't, doesn't believe in religion or these things spiritual, but then we can kind of uh, add it up in a, another way of just while saying uh, uh, lifestyle, you know? So this, I think, is uh, uh, very beneficial. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I really feel, you know, this particular point is so important, the spiritual part of it all. And I want to bring it back to you, you know, with spirituality. I, I, I know you're a very spiritual person and in your practice with all the uh, experiences that um, you have gone through. So what are those uh, salient experiences? You know, we have talked a lot, you know, about uh, uh, personally about your life. 
I really want you to share those, you know, moments, you know, you, you, you talked about certain episodes uh, of your father, uh, you know, how he practiced and uh, things that you saw and how the impermanence of life and that philosophy of life, um, you know, is incorporated into your practice. So mm-hmm. if you could talk a little bit about that and then we will, mm-hmm. you know, open the forum to questions. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. So I know uh, uh, Aris Krishna has a question, but you can ask it yourself once I open the forum. So if you could uh, comment on that, I really want you to talk about, you know, your your inspirations and your life in, in and in yeah. your practice. Yeah, I think uh, like Pranali, you in the beginning, you said uh, Raga, you know, your, 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 Ra- after your mother. Yeah. Sorry. Raka, yeah, yeah, Raka, because it it has generated because of your love for your mother, right? Mm-hmm. Because you love your mother, you are grateful for her, and it has generated that feeling that you you think that's because of, for her in her name you want to help people, people who are, you know, uh, not as uh, kind of fortunate as us, you know. So I think in life I've always felt that because my life as a refugee child. Um, grown up in not, not in minimal, you know, I would say, but I was grown up with so much gratitude, so much love, not just for my family, but for the people around me, my neighbors, my, you know, friends, you know, my Indian friends. Uh, and, um, and I studied because through sponsors, my godmothers, and you always have this kind of feeling of gratitude towards life, you know? And I think even to now, I always tell my children, you know, when you have your heart is full of gratitude, uh, when you have this, uh, your heart is full of gratitude, you begin to appreciate life. You begin to see life beautiful when you have this gratitude. And you have the sense of feeling of responsibility that I have been brought up with kindness and uh, I should also, when I have, I should also uh, have the ability to share that kindness, share that love because I have been brought given that and also that's one thing I think in my life even though we grew up in the poverty but uh, never felt poor you know because I see the, my neighbors who are much poorer than me you know and I always think oh I, I'm much like uh, no, much richer than them you know and um, also our heart our mind uh, even though we are not well off but then my father because of his honesty I think it's very very important for our children to integrate these things values, uh, family values, of the honesty, uh, these things, I think, give us the real um, confidence as a being, you know, even though we are, we are like not well off, our family in a very poor house, we go out, out with you know, pride, you know, people respect us, people respect my father, um, because they think that this man cannot be, you know, uh, they have no guts to talk to him in loud wise, you know, because no, he is very honest. He can stand up. He is very uh, kind of um, simple, but when it comes to his uh, principles and everything, he is very, very wild or very strong. So I think that has also kept us very strong, and uh, that's why I'm seeing uh, the on- honesty uh, in someone in children uh, gives real confidence in life. So because you are not fearless when you are honest. You don't have, like my mother, I love when you talk about Himalayas. My mother, I think I remember, often tells us about, you can see, when we gossip about people, we talk about it. She doesn't like her, uh, when we gossip about, about people. She says, she's, you know, mountains have ears, eyes, they can see. You can't have to hide that. So if you do some mischievous thing or some stealing or something, she means to say that somebody is watching you. And if she's at night, she says, Corners, I mean, in Tibet, we say in uh, Sikung, Sikung is the holes, you know, and our houses are wooden where we can peep, you know, inside people's house. So she said, here in the uh, holes, they have ears. Don't talk all nonsense. She would say that, it, you know, always remind us that mind your um, language, she would say that whatever you're talking, uh, talk with responsibility, you know, and uh, but uh, but my father was very kind of fearless when he is wrong, he will say it loudly, you know. So these things, and also uh, small things like uh, when talking Himalayan principles, um, I, I, uh, if I can share, my grandmother was uh, got blind in uh, uh, one eye blind. 
And uh, she, I remember she was always telling us that she got blind because she could uh, she could devote her life, the remaining life in her spiritual practices. Because only after she got blind, she started sitting at home. Uh, before that, she was walking. She was doing for road work also. And then she sat at home because she sat in her dream. Uh, one monk came, I think her husband. Uh, he said, now, in action, he said, in Tibetan, we do rosary, no money. So she was acting like that. And uh, she started practicing from then on. In a small bag from morning, five o'clock, she will start. Only for at one point, she'll come to the another room for prayer. And then she will sit in uh, her bed and her breakfast, her lunch, her dinner, everything served on that bed. And at uh, night, she will do prostration, 100 prostration every night. Morning, night, by 10 p.m. exact, she will sleep because I sleep beside her. That was her practice, very. And uh, she, uh, I said when she was dying, she was bedridden for like six months, but no pain, but she can't like get up. But she was always talking about her next journey. Uh, in Tibetan, Bardo, we have right? a book called, yeah, Pardo, Bardo. Tibetan book of that, right? We, that book, and she requested my father to read for her. My father couldn't, you know, he was very emotional. But she was like, why are you crying? He was like in tears when she said. And he, she would uh, keep her head on his, this one, uh, this one, what he called that lap. And he would read that, you know. And she was read. she said, and uh, after every birth means death, you know. So uh, I don't fear, you know, and, uh, and you shouldn't worry. And uh, he, he, he actually, uh, she actually told him that you have many children because we are like four, you know. So she said, I don't have worries for you. You're, you, uh, uh, you have very um, bright children. And uh, I, I, I think that these children will look after you when you're old. And you have a very good wife, very kind wife. So I don't worry now. So she sold everything she has, you know, for, to give away to people, for monasteries and everything. And she said, you don't need this money. So she said, if I uh, devote uh, to all this to the poor people and uh, rituals and uh, spirituals, this, what do you call the what it was, um, karma or good karma will be also on your family. So I'm not, so she sold off everything. She didn't, she only left uh, this prayer wheels and rosary, her rosary, which she used to use every day. So that I'm going to leave for you, my mother and father, you use this. And so now my parents are using this, you know. And so I think this uh, way of thinking, you know, she was never tried, I'm blind like that. She took it another way. Similar to that, my mother, I remember once my youngest sister, she lost her 3,000 rupees, okay? And we don't have much money. And she was crying, she was crying. And she said, she told me this. And she called home and she was crying. My, and it, my, she told my father, I lost the money that you gave, you know? during her college and I don't have money and she is crying. Then my mother took out the phone and she said, oh, Pomo, it's a daughter, don't cry, you know? Now it's lost. Just pray that this money has been to someone who is very needy, needed. Just pray that. Money should be in the hand of someone who is in need. Just pray that. And that very word calm her like anything. She said she forgot every pain that she was going through. Oh, I don't have money and it. That has relieved the pain that she the lost of her money. She said, oh my God, yeah, now it's lost. But it, it's in the hand of someone who is needy. I think that kind of philosophy we have, I think, help us to, um, if we, we encounter, because in life, it means we, we always will encounter some problems, some loss or something. Uh, I think it's, uh, like I said, the perspective of thinking can uh, change uh, the way you feel you know you're yeah. at one point you are like heavy heart and then when you are relieved you know like you said you do it for your mother you know I when I was growing up I was a fear of losing my parents and uh, then one day I felt okay if my parents because they're always like sick sick or like that so I thought okay if they die um, then I, when I become bigger when I can earn I will just look after all people and that from that day, my this uh, fear become um, I mean lesser, I mean pain, the guilt. What do you say, guilt? You know. So say some people, I have seen people say, oh, I couldn't serve my mother, I couldn't serve my parents. They had get, let, live with this guilt. So to release this kind of guilt, I think if you dedicate this love to someone else, 
I think that's also one way of uh, thinking, right? Yeah, I, I, I totally, I, I think this um, whole idea of letting go of, you know, mm -hmm. bitterness and angst and anger, uh, because when you hold on to these things, you're troubling your own self. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there is no solution. The solution is in letting go. Because, mm -hmm. and if you understand that nothing is permanent, everything is transitory. We are here to learn our lessons. And I think crisis are situations which teach us the most. And whenever we mm -hmm. have crisis, we should embrace the crisis. Of course, as humans, we kind of uh, grapple with it. It's upsetting. But we have to be objective and know that this crisis is teaching us how to get past it, get to the other side. It's like a journey, right? A journey of self-evolution. Where the I, we, uh, that ahankar, that uh, mm -hmm. the idea of uh, pride, kind of, it, it comes down. And uh, oneness yes. and happiness, not for just yourself, but giving happiness. I think mm -hmm. that is what makes the difference. And, uh, you know, with you, I've seen, you, you know, I'm getting comments also that uh, just listening to your stories are so healing because these are stories of inspiration of your own uh, trajectory of life where you learned right from your childhood, observing your parents. And that's why it's so important to observe, mm -hmm. to learn from your, uh, you know, uh, grandparents, from your parents and how they perceive life. How can you make it better? what can you learn and uh, you don't have to learn everything but whatever mm -hmm. is good and makes you happy and give happiness right mm -hmm. so um this is such an amazing uh, uh talk and uh, like i said uh, dr lakpa dolma in february in our newsletter we will be announcing we will have uh, um uh, sessions of her online um, so she will be um, practicing with uh, the Himalayan Institute. So we are very, very happy about that. And uh, she'll be having online consultations and we'll give details in our newsletter, which is coming up uh, in February. So anyone who wants to have consultations can contact us, uh, contact her through that link and uh, she'll be there. She will also hold workshops in Dhami in Shimla uh, and uh, with uh, uh, Rina who uh, you know will help her and of course I said the wellness center is all encompassing so those of you who want to come uh, who want to visit her virtually uh, please stay connected and if you haven't received the newsletter which is a technological glitch not in my hands just message me and I'll send it to you so uh, let's have uh, the forum open for questions there are a lot of questions. So uh, let's start. Um, I'm just opening the gallery so that um, we can have the questions. You can put your um, videos on now uh, so we can know who you are. So our first question is Romel. Uh, Romel, what's your question? Hey, hi, um, thanks for a very enlightening talk. So I have two topics, uh, two questions. You said someone in your family was involved with building roads uh, from right up to Ladakh. Mm -hmm. And who was it and how, how were they involved and are they still around? Yeah, can I answer this? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Yeah, my parents, when they came from Tibet, uh, they moved to uh, Himachal. Um, and I think they moved first, I think, to Ladakh. And they have in Tibetan uh, groups, uh, we call it uh, 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 in Tibetan. So they were walking on the roads and uh, one of my brother was born on the way. And uh, that's, you know, there's Kalat, you know, Kalat. The sulfur water springs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so my, 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 my parents, were on a, what, what do you call that? PWD, yeah? In uh, Himachal, we call PWD walker. They were on the road construction. So that's how this uh, particular school, in Tibetan school, was formed. Because every Tibetan were on the roads. They were from walking from uh, Manali towards that, going up, upwards towards uh, uh, Ladakh, I think. And so the children have, they can't take children all the time. So they formed the uh, school in the Patlipur. It was initially in a tent. So they keep the children there and uh, and it gradually become a school, TCB Tibetan school, a school. Yeah. 
So yeah, my parents are still alive and uh, not many people are now alive who have walked on those uh, roads. Uh, many beautiful stories how they're working. My mother used to tell me, she used to be, I think, very strong. She said, and during those days, uh, they used to get uh, uh, ana, you know, 50 ana, you know, 50 pesa, you know. So she said, uh, men get more than women, you know. <laughs> so she said she was very strong. So they, they used to send her with the men, you know. She was, can, you know, these quintals, you know, can carry. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I have answered that. Okay, so uh, that sounds very interesting to me because mm -hmm. uh, my dad's first, uh, probably his first uh, mm -hmm. assignment out of his engineering college was with the BDO, the mm -hmm. Border Roads Organization. And he mm -hmm. worked in uh, Ladakh right up till Kargil. Uh, he's oh. not uh, here anymore, but I have a lot mm -hmm. of these old pictures where we have oh. a lot of uh, these workmen actually. They are mostly of okay. ladies. They're all, uh, they seem ladies, to be Tibetan yeah. ladies. They and I have pictures action. of, yeah, and I have pictures oh, of children wow. and uh, most of the negatives are pretty like, you know, uh, uh, not exactly in a great condition. And I plan to actually visit um, these areas and see if some of these people are alive and if they can recount oh. their experiences. Yeah, so I would love nice. to connect with your parents. Oh, yeah, yeah, that will be lovely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, if, uh, I mean, I, I think I'll ask Sonali to... Uh, you know, exchange numbers, uh, contact numbers. Okay, so another uh, point about Tibetan medicine. So I'm, uh, I was an active journalist at a certain point of time. I did a story on Tibetan medicine. So this mm -hmm. was based out of Delhi. Uh, this mm -hmm. was in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. Now, very unfortunately, I mean, of course, we visited the clinic. Uh, it was very long time ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, when I followed up on a lot of these patients, they, they did not actually, they said uh, initially it seemed to be effective that the medicine, but really didn't really do uh, a lot. So that's my personal experience mm -hmm. uh, with uh, mm -hmm. Tibetan medicine. Now, after your talk, I'm very uh, curious because mm -hmm. you've linked spirituality so much to medicine, which, which is something I can relate to. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in terms of uh, sim uh, simply as being a uh, you know, a medicine to cure ailments. How effective is this? I mean, uh, could you probably, I mean, if you approach it, what are the what are the diseases it does not work on? Uh, somebody's uh, just a sec. Somebody's mic was on. Let me just. Uh, uh, I'll just mute the mic. Yeah, go on. Yeah. So, um, so what I wanted to say is, I mean. Uh, you, you also mentioned these journals which are uh, full of people's experiences. My collection is of, uh, uh, which is no longer with me, is actually one of people uh, which say we, it, it didn't really work for us. I mean, for some reason I have more of those cases then. So the question is, which yeah. are the areas, which are the diseases and stuff where it does not work? If we leave the spirituality angle alone, uh, I mean, if we if we mm. leave it out of the the you know the simple medical diagnosis and you know as a uh, mm. Tibetan medicine mm. as a cure for ailments, so where mm. is uh, which are the areas it doesn't work and where are the uh, which are the diseases for it which which it really functions? Yeah, I think uh, it's not only about Tibetan medicine. I think they are uh, in every system. I think they, they uh, there are sections which we cannot be touched. You know, uh, I mean, uh, not affected uh, in our, um, I would say in some cases, like where you need to, uh, like, what do you say, like gallbladder, you know, uh, a stone or that. In that, we have, you know, I found sometimes it's difficult. I won't say it doesn't uh, help. There are people who get uh, helped, kidney stone, all that. But there are also stories where people are, uh, uh, couldn't be helped, so they had to go for the surgery, you know. Yeah, there are similar, uh, for especially people like uh, a section or something like surgery uh, where it's needed. I think that we had, we, I mean, even though uh, in olden days there are surgery, but because of the, what do you call that, uh, seriousness, whatever that is, because it's risky. So the practice has been. Uh, kind of uh, like uh, diminished our like so we can't uh, we don't do a surgery as uh, much you know so I think in surgery part I would say we lack uh, otherwise most of the cases uh, there is a, a, a like a treatment 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So let's take the next question. Samit, uh, Samit, uh, your question, please. Yeah, hi, uh, uh, doctor. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know, are you connected to Dr. Dolkar in Delhi, Kalkaji? Because I recently consulted her. She's mm -hmm. also a Tibetan uh, doctor. Yeah. Yeah. So actually what happened is that I've... Uh, um, I'm suffering from a back issue and very interestingly, you know, just today morning I was doing yoga and it was all well. And just before this call, I slipped and I've got this pain. So I've put on a heat pad and all that. Mm -hmm. So I'll surely consult you, but are you from the same school? Do you know her? Uh, I have heard about, about her. She's a very famous doctor. No, but I don't know her uh, like personally. Yeah, but she, her mother was a very, very famous Tibetan doctor, lady doctor. Yeah, that I know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and what are lady practitioners called in the Tibetan medicine lineage? They're also called. Uh, uh, yeah. Mem we, in, in Tibetan words for doctor we call mempa. 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 Mempa, mempa means actually means pempa. Pempa means uh, help. He. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Member. Okay. So here we are with the Rajoli Ghosh. She is our research scholar. Rajoli, your question. Hello. Good evening. Good Thank evening. you for this uh, lovely talk. It was very insightful. Also, we got to know some more details about Tibetan medicine. Um, so my question to you is about herbs. Uh, you mentioned that um, you know in the month of August. Uh, the collection of herbs are done. So uh, why in the month of August? And um, uh, another question that I've had is, uh, how do people uh, who are involved in collection of these herbs, how do they get to know that some of these uh, plants are medicinal in nature? Uh, do they follow some features that these plants have? Or um, um, how is it done? Like how did the forefathers or Tibetan medicine experts get to know that these uh, plants are medicinal in nature? Thank you. Yeah, there are particular uh, uh, types of medicine which has to be uh, taken during uh, the, uh, what's the monsoon time. There are some uh, like uh, uh, medicines which has to be plucked or uh, harvested, what do you say? Uh, during summer. So depending on that, because on during that time, so the monsoon, I think in uh, August, so with that time, this plants, flowers, leaves are, uh, what do you call that? Uh, how do I explain? It's more, it's, it's like a peak of ripe to uh, the potential. So that's why we go on that. And um, about the herbs uh, recognition, I think it's passed on from generation to generation. Of course, we have books. Uh, and it's uh, like uh, defines how are the leaves, shape of the leaves and the taste of the, we have to taste, then the color and the texture, everything has been defined in our text, the herbalism, you know? So from that also, also mainly uh, like my father uh, through his own practice, because in Tibet, it's not like today, you know, where you have lots of herbs uh, co like collected and make medicine. It's like someone comes and they go out in the mountains he, he he has uh, more practice of making medicine than learning the text. So because he was a main a student, so he said he didn't actually put much interest in the medicine uh, because he said it's lots of work because you have to go up in the mountains, sometimes you go down near the lake and some, and then collect, they dry them, then you know you have to you know crush them. So it's lots of work. So through practice, you know. So because in you know Tibet. Is the mountain is lots of, especially my father from where he comes from, is the lots of vegetation, is a uh, forested area. So, yeah, through that, uh, like passing from generation to generation, uh, it's also uh, because of that, also uh, because we have text. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, um, Samit has asked a question, please. Uh, okay, yeah, so I, I'll ask this question after Liv asks her question. Liv, over to you. Do put your camera on, all of you, whenever you ask a question. 
Good morning. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, it was very informative and very uplifting. It was incredible. Um, I, I just want to understand a little bit your perspective of um, where you think, it, I, I live here in the United States, and if you have a headache, um, the first thing that you're going to be told to go do is just go take a bunch of migraine medicine um, from the pharmacy. Um, and that's become so standard that we have, we just take medicine almost mm -hmm. every day, every other day for any sort of mm -hmm. pain or ailment that we feel. Where do you think we can tie in? What, what does that look like marrying the pharmaceutical medicine of um, these pharmaceutical companies that produce like Tylenol mm -hmm. or Excedrin migraine medicine and um, the usage of Tibetan medicine and herbs. Where do you think both have a place, or do you think it'd be more it'd be better to subscribe to one or the other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Um, like, like, yeah, like I earlier said that the the treatment you know, when you are treating one problems, like you have a headache, you suddenly have a headache, but it's it's not the same headache in our Sorika. Headache is different. Sometimes you have headaches because you're hungry. And then we say because of too much. When you are hungry, then there's too much of air in our body, which makes you ha headache. Sometimes you're headache because too much heat in the body is tipa on the body. Because of that, you get headache. Sometimes because of indigestion, we get headache. Sometimes because of stress, we get. Sometimes because of neurological problem, we get headache. So we have to, like from uh, uh, so what first, like when we check the pulse, then the urine, and then of course integration, and ask about the food that you have eaten. So after doing all this analysis and all this test, we come to the conclusion to which medicine. Every headache is different. So we uh, give that uh, medicine according, sometimes because of sinus, you know, we get headache, half headache, migraine also we have headache. Uh, all the headaches are different, different, you know. Uh, so sometimes just by having uh, some food, your headache goes up. Sometimes just putting on oil, you know, when we have it more related with the uh, stress, sesame oil or some oiling can heal the headache. Or sometimes just by cold shower, if it's more of uh, uh, heat, uh, then just the cold shower can help. So it will depend, uh, it will uh, again, um, sometimes people have chronic headaches, you know. So th in these, Tibetan medicine works wonders because we try to trace the causes. What is triggering those uh, headaches? You know, sometimes say, okay, once a month I'm getting headaches. Sometimes when I go out in sun, uh, I always get headaches. It's more or less related with the bile or the liver uh, 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 condition, you know. So we get, um, again, it's uh, headache medicine is different. But in uh, medicine and allopathic, mostly people take paracetamol or in America, I think Tylenol and uh, this medicine, right? But in Soaripa, uh, it will be different from person to person. Yeah. So there are variations of the headache and uh, yeah. yeah, it's true, um, you know, with the uh, different things, I think, going the way which is more organic in nature kind of addresses the root problem. Uh, there's a question from Manan who is a biochemist and uh, he says that herbs and pharmaceuticals should not be mixed or taken together. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Should not, yeah, they yeah. shouldn't be taken together yeah, yeah. and why? Yeah, uh, yeah. We, uh, normally when I prescribe medicines, I always say I still give a one hour or two hour gap between these two, you know. So I think it's uh, um, a reaction because of the reaction between the two can uh, okay. kind of confuse. I mean, I think it's not good. Yeah. It's not good. So when uh, mm -hmm. in Ayurveda, I want to know what are the differences? And there were some questions regarding Ayurveda as well. Um, Samrat and Aris Krishna asked the same question that how different are I is Ayurveda? It's also an ancient uh, practice or tradition. How are they different? How is it different from Tibetan medicine? Yeah, uh, since I haven't studied Ayurveda, um, uh, but then what I've heard from, from our senior doctors uh, that that uh, initially, I mean, the in the fundamentals are more or less same. You know, we talk about what uh, what are pitta and kapha and all that. Uh, but I mean, in terms of spiritual practices, the way of formulating medicines, I think it's different from that. And when you go deep into the text, you know, 
it differs. Um, but they will, you will find many similarities because of the history. Uh, Tibetan medicine in, I think in eighth century, a king actually uh, invited uh, the weight or not the, uh, from different part of the world, especially India, then the, from you know neighboring countries. Like so, uh, from that they have like a first international seminar on this uh, the herb medicines, and uh, then the book had been compiled out of that. So we we in so what if we say it's like a, what do you call that essence of every um, uh, traditional medicines involved around the Himalayas, you know. Uh, so that's why you can see Yunani, you can sometimes see similarities that in Chinese medicine, you can see in Tibetan medicine. Likewise, I'm sure that they have taken from Tibetan uh, but, uh, uh, this knowledge, you know, and, uh, and included in their system, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember studying Egyptian medicine, uh, you know, ancient Egyptian medicine, and they also use honey and mm -hmm. lotus petals and all of that. So very, very, you know, uh, interesting that honey honey is used almost in every uh, kind of culture mm -hmm. for the properties. Mm -hmm. So uh, at this point, I would like to ask, you know, Puneet Agarwal is here and he messaged me yesterday. He said he has to attend this because... He uh, has uh, taken uh, Tibetan medicine. So let's ask him, how was his experience? Uh, and how was his experience Anubhav, uh, Tibetan Anubhav. medicine? Later. Yeah, hi, Sonali, and uh, hello, okay, Mampa uh, Dolma. So, and hello, everyone. So uh, not a question in particular, but uh, an experience I want to share. And uh, sorry for my voice, I have bad throat thanks to the city life uh, we are living in Delhi. So, yeah, so my father got diagnosed with the lung cancer in year 2017. He was somewhere in between stage three and stage four. And then one of my relatives, uh, our relative, he told that you go to McLeod Ganj and there is a doctor who could help you with. Uh, we went to McLeod Ganj. There was Dr. Yeshi Dhondel. At one point of time, he was the personal physician of Dalai Lama. And uh, he was, uh, at that time, I think 91, 90 years of age. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away in 2019. But yeah, uh, we went to him for the first time. He like uh, uh, diagnosed, but he checked the nerves. And, and with the urine, uh, morning first urine, he used to diagnose at what stage and what kind of cancer the patient is suffering from. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, he like, uh, my father can't teach, like you smoke a lot and you drink a lot, but actually my father never touched a uh, cigarette. It was because of sleeping apnea and all those breathing issues he had, he suffered. But yeah, and uh, uh, to me, he like treated me like his grandson, what we are say. And he told me that, where do you live in Delhi, in Lakshmi Nagar, I have a home. And, and I saw that in L block. So, yeah, so he gave the medicine uh, for the first time and my father took it. felt that, yes, there is, this is something. And uh, uh, the size of the lump, uh, fortunately, it went from 7.5 to 3 point, uh, around 3.5 centimeters. So four centimeter, it decreased. And uh, when I get the PET scan again, the doctors were amazed and they were asking like, what are you doing? And I means we never did any chemo, any radiation, anything. So that helped, that, that worked. But again, unfortunately, he was between three to four stage and uh, uh, it was malignant. So it went into his brain and he, was, he didn't survive. Means in 2018, we lost him. But uh, mm. I felt that, yeah, uh, what uh, what that Tibetan medicine has did, uh, even in Delhi, one of the gentlemen was saying, so uh, that was Dr. Dolkar uh, mm -hmm. uh, Kangla, something like that. So, yeah, okay. we took the medicine from him as well for my mother, depression and all. And, and it worked. We honestly speaking, we didn't take it for a longer time, but it worked. So uh, it do work and uh, definitely... Uh, an alternative for all those antibiotics and everything, especially when we are living in uh, a city like Delhi, which is already so polluted. We are already inhaling so many, so uh, so much polluted air. It's very important to get the treatment. Uh, roots say it should be treated, and uh, we get that cure. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, thanks for sharing, uh, Puni. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks for sharing. Uh, and Sonali. Yes. Uh, Sonali, this is Sonali. Can I can I just uh, speak for oh, a yeah, second? Oh yeah, Sonali. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I thought. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, my experience. I mean, I know Rulma for, uh, I don't know, about seven, ten years or so, and um, and I have also been treated. So, um, it was wonderful. I have hyper acidity, and you know, I used to cry, and she has seen me in pain, and uh, I don't know. Uh, I have been t I had taken a medicine few years back and it had really worked wonders for me as well. So every once in a while, even for depression or whatever problem I have, I generally approach her. For me, uh, <laughs> so for me, she's like you know my go-to person. When there's something, I'll just call her and say, "I saw her. I'm busy. I'm busy." And um, it has always worked. It has always always worked. Yeah. And. Uh, as you say, you know, pointed out that uh, you have heard stories, and I've heard every a lot of stories, and they are really, really, I would say, uh, very powerful and very healing. Uh, uh, and uh, that's about it from my side. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, role. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Sonali, uh, for sharing that. Yeah, it's very important, you know, stories inspire, stories about your life. Uh, one should always share, you know, your trials and tribulations with friends and uh, uh, your children, because who knows, you may sow a seed of uh, inspiration in them. And it's very important to tell your stories. And uh, personally, too, you know, uh, I have been consulting Dr. Dolma and uh, it's amazing like I myself see a lot of uh, changes in me because of uh, uh, her uh, medicines that I'm taking you know sleeping well and all of that so first of all you have to believe that uh, you know your body is just not um, a machine okay it is a living thing and you have to balance you know when we are balanced if when, when the kitchen is in order or the house is in order, we can think straight. So if your body is chaotic, you have to first calm your body, right? From external and internal uh, upheavals, just calm it. And then the medicine will work. So if you don't address things holistically, I really feel that um, it may work to a certain degree, but um, it's very important that emotions and the physicality all have a, uh, an important, uh, they all go together. We are humans. We are thinking beings, right? Um, Romel, what's your question? Yeah, I just wanted to know, do you do telephonic consultation? Is that possible? And secondly, uh, give us a few tips, you know, for common stuff like, you know, low vitamin B12 levels and high uric acid levels and stuff like that. So are there any, uh, you know, uh, good practices we can follow? So I will uh, just uh, comment on one part of it, Romel. From 15th February, Dr. Dolma will be doing online consultations. So you can connect with her for sure. And uh, if B12, you can, and <laughs> uric acid, you can tell him about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. About the vitamins and all that, I think is about the, how you eat. Not uh, not only about having good food. I think um, I always tell people that, um, like in the in, in, uh, in my talk, I said the diet. You know, uh, eating on time. You know, like morning breakfast. Uh, traditional. You know, we do this in the morning breakfast. Some sab saath breakfast karte hai, lunch and then dinner. So for uric acid, I would say that you should uh, reduce those uh, spicy food, you know, uh, the fermented, like especially ajar, like on the um, green chili, those things I you can avoid. And um, uh, also not to eat late. And that's, I think, very, very important. Yeah. And uh, of course, more vegetables. But when we say vegetables, uh, what I found in my Himachal also, my friends, they eat vegetables, vegetables, but it's like overcooked. And then again, we add lots of masala in that. I think that then not going to help so much. You know? So it should be vegetables when you say it's more or less, less spicy, less cooked, but steamed or you know, not very overcooked it would be um, uh, good. And um, 
of course, there's acidic, you had alcohol and all these things are not good. And uh, sleeping, that's also one very, very important thing. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't look like it's uh, related with the digestion, but it, it does, you know, sleeping on time um, is very, very important, you know. So uh, eating on time, sleeping on time, just like uh, I would say, uh, like a clock, you know, your body should be like like a clock, you know, which tells you the time, you know, morning you wake up, you say, okay, well, now it's breakfast time, and lunch around like 12 or 1, you feel that hunger, like, like that sound in your, which tells you that now you you need energy, and even same for the uh, dinner, so if you have this practice, is this uh, kind of schedule in your body, uh, then uh, everything goes fine, so whatever, any problem, whatever, all the problems, the root cause, is the digestion and digestion doesn't mean only uh, in, uh, the like good food, uh, but also the chewing from starts from chewing, you know, properly and, uh, and eating it like peacefully, you know, not in a hurry, you know. Most of the time, I see people like especially that breakfast, they have bread on the uh, eating, munching, and then working, packing things. And, it doesn't go like that, you know. So you have to sit down. If, if possible, you have to pray before. Like bless the food or just feel grateful for the food that you are having and enjoy the food and chew properly. So when you chew properly, you will have a taste. Whatever food you eat, bitter, whatever, at the end of the food, you know, when chewing, chewing properly, you have that kind of taste of uh, sweetness. That's very important. So it helps. And what do you call the enzyme or something? Enzyme. It helps the digestion starts from your mouth so it's very important to yeah. eat eat little but eat chew properly yeah, yeah. and uh, and uh, could you give some tips on general stress like how to manage general stress you know everyday stress mm -hmm. i think I, I've always felt, you know, we make work larger than life that we become so mm -hmm. involved that, oh, the world will be finished if it doesn't happen. It doesn't have to be like that, right? There should be like a time mm -hmm. for this, time for that. So how do you think uh, stress, how should one deal with stress? Daily stress of earning, earning, earning and, you know. Yeah, I think generally I found people, people are stressed because they are worried because of, I think fear rules our life. I, I think, uh, what, do you, what do you say? Fear of getting laid, fear of being missed, fear of being uh, not recognized, fear of not being appreciated. I think, I think oh, mm, that should be uh, minimized or um, how I say. I think fear rules us, you know. So as someone, I heard someone saying this, most of the time, 90% 90, 90 of the time, the fear doesn't come true. It's just in our minds, you know. Oh, it might happen, it might, this might happen, you know. Which never happens. Like for me, I give this example for myself. And always, when I was a little girl, I always had a fear of losing my parents. I think, oh, if they die. I lived that for many, 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 many years, you know. And only recently, like five, six years back, one of the day I, remember, I realized, all these years I lived with these fears and that was like kind of, you know, what do you say, nightmares, you know, I lived in that. But, and then at a point I accepted that this is life, aging is uh, life and I should accept it. And someday, someday this day will come where I had, you know, this day. they will, you know, with, you know with, with me. So it's like, uh, making your mind understand making you uh, and what i mean to say is sometimes uh acceptance you know accepting that whatever the tragedy happened if you accept that okay it has happened it's going to happen if you accept that and then you start thinking what can you do to um if the fear is or the whatever problem is coming how you're going to solve this you know is there's a solution i uh, the one thing i often say is if there's a problem and when you think about that, you analyze that. If you think you have a solution, of course, you think about that and you process how you're going to work on that. And if you are clueless what you're do, going to do and you have no uh, uh, idea, then best not to stop, uh, think on that, you know. Just stop there. You say, okay, this is not my cup of tea and just leave there. You know? Especially, I think people, mostly for young, for mothers, they always have the fear of um, their, their, for their children, you know. So, uh, but one thing, what happened is, 
whatever destiny is written one time i think at one point in time we also have to accept that there is something called destiny you know we have some percentage in our hand but less is the destiny so you do your best and it's okay let's live on the destiny that i think that's a one solution i apply on my life i i of course i have my three children you now so i get worried for and then like few second i will just tell them okay why don't you why not starting when i then i forget you know so i would say train your mind you know so stop uh, complaining you know what what i think when people is always complaining oh he's not being nice to me he's not and we stop thinking uh, questioning oneself what i am doing that that person is not liking me you know we have to, uh, a question that to uh, ask that you know they are mentally say oh he in a family say oh, he don't doesn't spend i have to spend but you also have to uh, ask yourself do you really spend are you generous i think everything comes from uh, us you know first from your uh, us you know uh, then i think this is uh, and also to remember that that you know we interpret and we say you always have to remember that i do this every day every night when i sleep and that actually uh, stop you from like the, the greed you know we have want is necessary my mother says uh, as long as i'm breathing there will always be a, a need it means that i am not dead the day there is no need for me it means i'm dead so this is nothing wrong that we need you want to have that you want to have but we also have to know between the difference between the want and the greed you know so that's also one important thing so when you think about it that okay tum itna kuch yahan se harap ke wahan se baimani se logon ko kya bolte hai kisi ka kisi ka le loge to yeah kisi ka it's not going to stay with you even i say if i spend something for someone i give i always think like okay in any way it's going to i if i eat that money is gone on me it's not where if i give to someone again same thing is gone is not with me you know some way is going to be hum kya sochte hai okay mere bachcho ke liye same same thing is not with you tum apne bachcho ke liye itna is zindagi mein itna dukh sa ho itna bahme baimani karunge sab you have to bear that you know that karma you know not your children so not going to benefit the children also the money that you have earned through uh, dishonesty you know so if you think that way you know you i think uh, the kya hota greed hota na kabhi hum zyada tar kya hota that, that greed also makes us um, keep us sleepless hmm. you kyunki sochte rehte ho kyunki jab tumhare mind mein baimani baith jata hai then you start to plotting things ye karunga wo karunga when you say lies and then it bolte ek so so jhoot ke piche so kya ek you keep it so you bona pata hai this way like that you know how to cover that how to cover the how to cover that so when you life become like in the beginning so when you life just more honesty um you uh, life becomes simpler you know so think about that that's the and think about uh, uh the, your loved one you want wish good for your the children your uh, relatives your parents of course that other person also wish for that no same same thing you know if you know that give the example to yourself how do you want to feel how do you the other things so that's like the, what do you call the empathy you know generous yeah. the more empathy we have uh, i think we will become more peaceful i think i feel that way i i definitely um i definitely feel that uh, there is a lack of empathy uh, a lot in people today and empathy and compassion is very important and uh, i was just thinking about you know certain examples while you were talking so i worked with this collector who used to gather these textiles from borneo yeah so uh, he always used to he had a beautiful house but when i used to go and work there he was here in california a beautiful place and deer used to come and uh, a, a collection like a museum so he would leave the um, property open the doors open and i would ask him why do you leave it open you know anybody can come and rob you he said oh they will stay with their guilt i i don't care if they want to come and take it good they will remember me that they they took it from me <laughs> you know he was an old man but he was so uh, so in a tune with everything he didn't bother he didn't carry he said i don't want to carry the weight of that lock he says mm. i want to be free in the true sense and uh, 
at home i always leave my things like that i i also don't bother and you know there that that village in um, nasik i don't remember what's the name of that village but they leave their doors open they and they and they, there's a myth attached to it that if you lock your things and you know bad things will happen but this whole idea of locking and uh, uh, you know all of that it's like what you said it's our fears playing out right uh, that the mistrust because we have experienced and we see everybody with that suspect nature people who even who are trying to be nice we feel what is their agenda why are they trying to be nice to me mm. and uh, mm. we don't talk to individuals we lose out on conversations because of fears and conversations mm. that can be so healing um mm. i also want to share you know when my mother was dying you know the first time she kind of went down and she was very serious um i was so attached i was like no this can't happen i want to control this i want her to be in the mountains because we were in the plains and i was so angry okay the second time it happened there was a change because i said no i cannot hold on to her i started reading the bhagavad gita and i started reading the chapters and i realized sonali you have to let go nothing is permanent and i said mm. i'll still be attached to her in a detached way and i let go mm. i said mama go i'll 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 be okay i'll be still attached to the love that i have for you but go i don't want you to be in pain and when i felt there was this weight that lifted off of course the attachment and you know buddha talks about attachment misery we are here you know attachment is a very important we are attached to our, mm. so many things our laptops our phones don't work we get oh my god ab kya hoga kuch nahi hoga time will keep moving we just have to adapt and adjust and i think mm. uh, tibetan medicine um you know addresses these things finer things in life that we forget we choose to forget so all mm. of us who are here you know i'm sure you have heard dr dolma very carefully uh you know we have a small gathering if you are able to make these changes in your own life uh, on the uh, lines that dr dolma has suggested i think we would be a good lot and we can spread that awareness and it's important to do that because if we don't do that we will just talk we won't practice and the practice is very important we don't just want to be talkers and think that things will change on their own we have to start with our own selves first and uh, all of you here take a pledge that you will do it be aware that's all that's needed yeah so dr dolma we uh, have this uh, whole tradition you know of uh, uh words of wisdom and of course i don't want to spook you <laughs> uh what are your inspiring what what is that one line of inspiration that you want to leave us with um and uh, then i'll make a couple of announcements so what what is that uh you know one line that has inspired you and you want to leave us all with uh, a thought uh, a philosophy of life a philosophy from the himalayas Mm-hmm. I think I would say two two things one for my mother one for my th- uh, father I think this comes to, it came to my mind uh my mother <clears throat> I said in my home there were few people were staying with us not related but they st- stayed with us you know so there was one man who was like grumpy you know what do you say and he used to um, kind of you know irritate me sometimes I used to do everything cleaning his pot in everything but still he i uh, used to kind of complain everything then i one day i was a little bit upset in the morning and my mother said okay give milk to him i said no i'm not going to give him you know he, even i do all this he is still saying all these things and then my mother said at that i still remember this place where she said in the milk and she said go if someone is bad you don't have to become like that person and i i i don't know it touched me you know i don't have to become like him you know so i went and gave the milk you know that was one thing so every time i like i always remind her sometimes some people are nasty some people then i can react the same way um, but i think i'm not that person and um, i i try to kind of understand the 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 situation of the person mental whatever maybe whatever it is so 
and I, I always I remember my mother. I said, okay, I don't have to be them. Be let him be that. I don't have to become like. This is one thing I think we have uh, uh, helped me. And the second thing, my father used to say, often used to say, even a dishonest, um, uh, what do you call it? Ek beman maliko bi ek imandar nokar ki zarur hota hai. Like or also if a very dishonest friend also need a very very honest. friend you know that is something i love this because in this world everybody wants a trustworthy friend or honest uh, you know even though you are very dishonest where you are not loyal but still you want other person that means the value of honesty value of trust you know so that i, I think yeah, there are many many things my father has is uh, like my role model and uh, but these two are something is uh, I always keep in my heart, you know. Yeah, those are true. I think I will part with this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> true, inspiring words of wisdom. You know, everybody is such yeah. a blank here. Uh, uh, Doctor Dolma mm-hmm. and I are the only faces that can be seen. It'll be lovely to see your faces. <laughs> you two are the only beautiful people. <laughs> yeah, don't hide behind your cameras because really, we would love to see you. It's okay. Yeah. yeah maybe some. <laughs> I just. Uh, not, not I just love. I just know those who are not comfortable. Please be a little uncomfortable. So, if you, <laughs> yeah, if you have some stories to share at this point with us, it would be lovely. Um, uh, I'll make a few announcements. So, uh, next week on, um, we are not doing it on a Saturday. We are doing it on a Sunday. So, uh, we'll do a Sunday vibe session with uh, uh, Lochan Tulku Rinpoche. He will be talking about the Heart Sutra. Uh, the Heart Sutra is a wonderful Sanskrit text. Um, and um, the thing about the Heart Sutra is uh, it helped me cope with my father's passing. And it came at a time when uh, 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 Tulku Rinpoche ji, he uh, told me about the meaning of formlessness, form, and uh, you know what is beginning and what is end. Mm. Uh, and these are the true essential philosophies of life. So those of you um, who want to hear him, because he, uh, uh, you know, he has immersed his life in the Heart Sutra. He is the head of the key monastery in Lahore Spiti. Uh, has a huge following. He's the 19th reincarnation of uh, uh, Rinchen Zanpo, who was the architect of um, the earliest Buddhist monastery. So he has this tradition, and he's such a wonderful, warm-hearted person, just like Doctor Dolma. You know. Uh, in the Buddhist practice, I really feel that compassion and empathy are such integral characteristics of uh, of people. That uh, these are the things that we need to learn, you know, to uh, make our lives better and those around us better. So, anybody wants to share anything, uh, please feel free. Uh, such an inspiring talk from Dr. Lakpa Dolma today. Uh, anybody wants to share anything? And this quiet, yeah, uh, yes, uh, Sangeeta, Sangeeta Masi, come on, uh, very happy to see you here. We can't hear you, you're mute. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, I mean, after a very long time, I've uh, had the time to uh, hear all the interesting things uh, happening. And uh, uh, Lapka, uh, I must say one thing that even the very first time when I met you, I I remembered whatever you said for such a long time. Although you're not so, uh, I, I mean, where age is concerned, I'm much, much older than you are. And, uh, but I feel the wisdom which you share is just so deep and so healing. And uh, I, I didn't want to say anything. I a lot of stories, of course, which we can be shared at this point. But um, sometimes you just go into a sort of a trance listening to people uh, who have so much goodness in them. And um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, your medicines must be healing. And there's so much depth into um, whatever you have said. I couldn't re- hear much uh, because I'm out of station and I didn't have the time to really be uh, listening through and through. But whatever little I could manage to hear, it is just very, very wonderful. And uh, uh, yes, there are a lot of stories in everybody's life, but your uh, stories uh, really reach out and touch you. And uh, I feel so nice that uh, I can uh, get to talk to a person like you. 
and I'm sure uh, we will be uh, gaining so much with uh, knowing you. And uh, we are looking forward that when you come to Dhami, uh, it will be a celebration for all of us. <laughs> Thank you. And so at much. the same time, I must say the same for Shonali also. Uh, the spirit with which she does, she works, is also amazing. And she's also a wonderful person. And she attracts very good people like you. <laughs> Thank you. I attract <laughs> bad people too. <laughs> that's, your, that's, your, that's your learning sometimes. That's my learning. To... <laughs> that's yeah. your learning. Yeah. But uh, uh, thank you, Shanali, for uh, um, bringing. Uh, I, I never pronounce words very clearly, correct? Lapka. Dolma. Dolma. Yes, yeah, dolma. Yeah, dolma. That's easier. I, I'm yeah, bad yeah. at it, uh, saying uh, <laughs> the word the words correctly at times. So excuse me for that. Uh, it was really nice listening to you. And give my deepest regards to your parents. Thank you. Thank I mean, you. I was when I was listening to you, I was wondering how good a parent have I been. <laughs> You're <laughs> a really wonderful parent too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you just realize that sometimes parents teach uh, children much more and sometimes they can go wrong and the people like... Uh, Dolma's parents can teach a lot. <laughs> that in spite of all your problems, you could, uh, their problems, and still they could keep such a upright way of bringing up the children is amazing in today's world. And you are so correct that honesty is something which is strength. Very well said. Thank you. And uh, thank I want you to so much. Thank, thank you, you so for much. your words. I want to introduce uh, Navjot Didi here. Uh, you know, we have a connection she's in Arizona right now we have a connection from childhood we were together in Indonesia when I was a little girl and for her coming it's just so beautiful because she is my connect to my childhood so if you want to say a few words that will be lovely yes Sonali thank you so much I just I was going to say that I will say some words for sure like um uh, like uh, Ms. Pramila was talking about her parents, I do feel that the root comes from Buddhism because I know it is extremely, a very strong and a very beautiful, pure philosophy, which brings out what your parents are, Dr. Dolma, and brings out what you are. And uh, that's what I want to say. And I'm so, so grateful for Sonali. I just mm -hmm. love it. I just enjoyed myself thoroughly. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so glad you could come and keep coming. And I would like to have uh, uh, Rina, if you're here, Rina, if you could put your video on. Rina in Shimla, I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rajoli, can you put, tell Rina to come online? Yeah, there she is. So, Rina, unmute yourself. We have to applaud Rina for becoming a yoga teacher. She is very dedicated. Oh. Yes. She is now trained to teach yoga. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, she will be doing the yoga and meditation part of our holistic center. She is. Uh, she has a BSc in nursing also. Very dedicated healer. And um, uh, Dr. Dolma, of course. Uh, like I said, Together, they're coming up uh, from the 15th of February, online consultations with Dr. Dolma uh, on Hicks and uh, more on the, in the newsletter and go to our website. There'll be a link where you can connect with Dr. Dolma for online consultations. Um, they'll be very reasonable. We want to keep that. We are a nonprofit. We want to make sure that this, uh, 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 even the practice of uh, Tibetan medicine and a lot of people get healed. Um, I wouldn't have, uh, you know, even connected with this if I hadn't, uh, you know, had these medicines. And I, I do want to tell that when you have these medicines, I remember my doctor asking, oh, what are, how are these medicines? I said, they, I feel very earthy after I have them. He says, oh, what's the taste like? I said, it's like dry mud. Uh -huh. I said, oh, and that's why they're earthy. So she said, oh, oh, I never thought of that, that medicines could taste like dried mud, but they're, they're very I don't know. The taste is so uh, so beautiful, I would say. It's so earthy. Uh, you don't feel like you're having medicine. And uh, that's the beauty of Tibetan medicines, I think. 
and um, uh, Dr. Dolma and mm -hmm. Rina. Rina has a lot to learn from you uh, about uh, Tibetan medicine. And I think together, uh, you know, when you start doing workshops and uh, uh, of course, online consultations, that would be wonderful. So Rina, congratulations for your new achievement and more to come. And uh, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anybody else wants to talk, and then after that, we can call it a day. Uh, uh, you know, we are here to uh, make sure that all of us keep connected. Next week, Sunday, um, we have uh, Lochan Tulku Rinpoche ji on the Heart Sutra, uh, and we have a lot of other talks. We'll also have a talk by Ian Baker on Vajrayana Tantra. Uh, uh, Dr. Manju Kak on Nicholas Rorick's legacy. We'll have Dr. Bala Ganpati, uh, the uh, head of the Department of uh, Philosophy. He'll be talking about the Mahabharat uh, in on March 4th. Right now, the visiting professor in the University of West Indies. So we have a whole lineup of uh, 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 people who have studied philosophy or who uh, practice a, a particular philosophy of living in the Himalayas in their profession. So all of you uh, keep connected. Uh, we Our newsletter is all about philosophies of the Himalayas this month. Uh, um, we will be um, releasing it on February 15th. You can go to our website. It's free. You can just put in your email address, put a check mark, and it should come. If it doesn't, there's a glitch. I'm not responsible, but I will still make sure you get the newsletter. And uh, we are also starting our Prayatnam grant uh, from the Prayatnam Grant Foundation. Uh, Neeraj is here. Uh, we'll be sponsoring two, he's sponsoring two uh, grants for uh, um, uh, students from, uh, youth from uh, rural Himalayas uh, to become stewards for culture and heritage. They will be in residence in Dhami. Uh, Mahima is not here, but of course, uh, Dhami is her village and uh, um, we are very, very looking forward. We will be moving in on February 15th. All of you are invited. We'll be inaugurating it when I'm there. Uh, of course, I, don't, I want to save the best for last. Uh, so let's call it a day. Wonderful to have Dr. Dolma in our midst, enlightening us on the right way to live, the right way to be happy and heal. So all of you emulate these principles in your life. They may be Buddhist, but they're very secular. They're very practical. Mm. And uh, that's the way to be. That's the way to live your life. And um, thank you, Vibhaji. Vibhaji is also here. Thank Sonali, you. two things. I wanted to say two things, Sonali. Yeah. So one is a question, Dr. Dolma. Do you have a, a blog or a YouTube channel or something like that where you share all this wisdom? I mean, that will be very <laughs> enlightening. That's the first thing. No, yeah, I'd been uh, my friends there, uh, you know, Sonali here, and she, she'll know. She was always telling me that you should write, write. I write, but I don't make like blog or something, I just share with my friends. Um, for me, it's like I, I, <clears throat> it's like I'm like insp inspiring myself, you know. I recall all those uh, learning from my parents, especially, and also life, my teachers, my. Uh, not just my parents, of course, the people I have grown up with, um, everything, you know, life lessons, even for now, you know. And um, I wanted to, but I am not bold enough to like. I would like to interrupt and, here, and I say yeah, she writes so beautifully. Nice. Yeah, that's what I would yeah. like to interrupt here. And I, I would say I have read most of her writings and she writes beautifully because she always shares with me and I always tell her, please make a note of it. But she never does that. No, she so is doing that, that so she is, uh, uh, she's writing a feature in the newsletter. So you will all see it. Oh. So uh, if you've subscribed okay. to the newsletter, please, uh, uh, you know, I I pushed her into writing and she did. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Good, good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Romel, you will, you will get that. Yeah. 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 One yeah. more thing. So um, uh, Dr. Sonali, I think you asked uh, uh, a question about stress and uh, Dr. Dolma's answer was, you know, uh, appreciation will actually reduce your stress. So I think all of us should take a moment to appreciate Dr. Sonali for all the <laughs> she's doing. 
<laughs> no, no, thank you, Romel. I'm I I know all of you always appreciate me when uh, but it's uh, I just feel that the Himalayan Institute is just not mine. It's everybody's. It couldn't be possible without you all who have the patience to come online and listen to meaningful talks. We are connected in a way that uh, will make. Uh, you know, the mountains, uh, you know, they're already uh, sentinels of the north, but the kind of bliss and the purity that they carry, it's just our task to keep connected. And thank you for appreciating it. Uh, just uh, keep coming and keep spreading the word. And that is the best appreciation that one can get. So uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, 15 February, watch out for Dr. Dolma on the Hicks website with online consultations so uh, with the himalayan institute and uh, thanks for you know adding us adding one more hat to the himalayan institute with your expertise we are very grateful to you for doing thank this thank you thank yeah. you for having me. yeah thank yeah. you bye everyone we'll call it a day thank see you everyone bye. yeah see you on sunday now okay sunday uh, february the 12th same time Bye. Bye-bye.